when there's a fire or a flood, what do people do? They tell you exactly how much danger there is in simple terms, even if it's still uncertain, and they tell you exactly what to do. If you're going to sound the alarm, you have to tell the truth. This anti-fear thing doesn't come from any logic. It doesn't come from any argument that's based in reality or applied anywhere else. Right? In the rest of our society, when we need to engage people in action and there is a fearful, scary threat, then fear is used. And so I think it's very important to recognise that the evidence is overwhelming that it works. Well, the first thing to say is in terms of, in terms of responding to the emergency and being effective, like 95% of your efforts should be on transgressive action and 5% of your effort on talking to journalists, mm -hmm. okay? So that's principle number one, right? You have to face up to the fact that only civil disobedience at mass scale in a very, very challenging way, blockading streets, shutting down bridges, closing down roads, closing down cities, nothing short of that. I don't think there's any evidence um, of having worked historically in driving massive social change. I'd like to acknowledge that we are all meeting here on stolen land and that sovereignty was never ceded. I'd like to pay my deepest respects to elders past, present and emerging. And um, I would also like to acknowledge that we are, exist in a time of climate and ecological emergency and that our actions today and every day impact the habitability of our planet for ourselves and generations to come. And I'd like to acknowledge that First Nations people have been on the front line of that emergency since colonization. And I'd also like to acknowledge all of you for taking time out of your day to address that emergency. So thank you so much for joining us to learn about the psychology of, of the language that we use and the messaging that we use. Over to you, Paul. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, great. Thanks, Violet. And thanks for uh, inviting me in, Jane. And Roger, as always, good to uh, be involved with you and, and uh, talk about these well, the most important issues really that we face um, in the movement, I think, is how do we inspire people to act? How do we generate the level of intensity and emergency that we need? Um, I'll just make a couple of quick comments on that uh, as a kind of older environmental campaigner in Australia. Um, remembering that, you know, in the mid to late 80s when I was at Greenpeace, we had the same conversation, um, not about the climate emergency, but about broadly speaking, is it best to argue fear? Is it best to argue solutions? You know, what engages people? What makes people feel comfortable? What connects the biggest number of people to an issue? So I think this is not a just a climate emergency issue. It's a question of when and, and how do you effectively communicate to the broader public on these issues? And in particular now, though, how do we sort of get across that level of intensity and urgency? And it's a, I think it's a very important debate, obviously, you know, not, it's not one size fits all for every human being on the planet. People respond in different ways. But there has to be, I think, a, a broad alignment in the movement, which is why I was very pleased to be invited to join today and, and to have this conversation with you. It's very important we get broad alignment in the movement as to, you know, how intense we go in terms of communicating this issue. Um, clearly noticing that, you know, for the last <clears throat> 30 years I've been working on climate change and 40 years on sustainability, um, we haven't yet succeeded in engaging people the right way. So clearly there is some work to be done in how we do that. So I think it's a, it's a super important topic um, and great to have Jane and, and Roger on board for that. Let, let me just um, make one more relatively brief comment, which is that this, is, this emergency has been coming for a long time. Um, it's not like it's a sudden surprise that it's an emergency. And for those of us who've been involved in the movement, you know, it's pretty obvious that we're coming to this point. It's obvious that the science said we were going to arrive at a point where there was an emergency response unless we responded beforehand, which we clearly weren't. And so this idea that we were coming to this point is not new for us. Uh, and there's a certain amount, I think, in the movement of, we've been saying this for a long time, people aren't responding, etc. So I think it's really important to recognise that for us, it's an old issue. But for many, many people, and I'd say most people in society, it is a new issue. You know, I'm, I'm constantly amazed by the number of people in the corporate sector, in the, in the general community, and in other forms of activism who just don't, don't pay attention to the climate emergency as an emergency and sort of see it as one more environmental issue. 
So I think that's a really important context to recognise that we are dealing with a context in which case in which people have not yet engaged substantially. And that sort of leads many people to say, oh, we should be careful, we shouldn't be too harsh, we shouldn't speak to horses, etc. And that to me is is like the central argument which is worth discussing in the conversation Jane and I had about this call and Roger and I I have had many times, which is it is you know, does it freak people out to know the truth? Right? And should we therefore modify the truth, as many in the movement have been doing for a long time, to try and not scare people before they get involved? And that to me sort of frames the frames the comments. So with that I'll throw it over to Jane. Jane, as many of you know, having joined the call, is a um, clinical clinical psycholo psychologist, uh, author of Dement in the Emergency, which sort of says where she's coming from. Um, six years ago, went into semi-retirement to campaign on the climate emergency, and much to the delight of many of us in Australia, has been one of the people involved in bringing uh, XR to Australia. So Jane, I'll throw it over to you to um, take us through your, your arguments. Hi, everybody. I'm now gonna try and launch a um, screen share. So what we know from the pandemic, is that we can take emergency action, but we need a willingness to tell the truth, even though it does make people afraid. We need a personally relevant threat that's present. We need proportionate action that people can take, and we need leadership. Okay, with the climate and ecological emergency, we're basically lacking all four. We've got hesitation to tell the truth, a threat that's hard to convey, proportionate action that's difficult to imagine, and a serious lack of leadership. If we were going to tell the truth, what would it look like? We know, first of all, that there's a lot of non-truth going on. And some of that's very obvious and clear, but there's a different kind of not telling the truth that's gone on with the climate and ecological emergency. And this is summed up in a recent paper by scientist Kevin Anderson saying, that there's all sorts of talk that goes on behind the scenes amongst climate campaigners and also amongst scientists. When there's no microphone turned on. When the microphone's turned on, they say all sorts of different things. And so there's people who said that two degrees was impossible who are now going out still saying that 1.5 degrees is possible. It's just not true. That's what Kevin Anderson's saying. David Wallace Wells is one of my favourite journalists and he got into a lot of trouble for trying to tell the truth in an article called The Uninhabitable Earth. And he got attacked by climate scientists and campaigners based on this idea that fear doesn't work and that he shouldn't be scaring people. He thinks that it, there's even a 1% chance that we could end the human race. It's something the public should know about, just ethically. Leave aside whether it works or not. Ethically, how can we have this terrible threat coming down on us and not tell anyone? If we were going to describe it, well, the biggest obstacle is this belief that fear doesn't work. So first of all, I'll go through some of the evidence. Like the evidence is really strong that fear does work. That's why we've got these scary cigarette packages. But usually I just show the packages. I'll now take you through some of the research. This is from a meta-analysis of 98 public health studies. The summary is that the stronger the threat, the more likely people are to act. But you need proportionate action. So you've got to tell people it's really, really bad, you're risking death, but there's something you can do. Again, that's from the meta-analysis of 98 public health studies. And this is from a more recent meta-analysis of 127 public health studies. And the conclusion is that they are effective and there are no circumstances in which they backfire and lead to undesirable outcomes. That's why every public health campaign you've ever seen uses them, also politicians use them. And of course, emergency messaging. When there's a fire or a flood, what do people do? They tell you exactly how much danger there is in simple terms, even if it's still uncertain, and they tell you exactly what to do. If you're going to sound the alarm, you have to tell the truth. Now, when it's locked the gate and gas, the personally relevant threat bit is easy. It's very concrete that the gas companies are going to come onto your land, they're going to pollute the air, they're going to pollute the water. Um, it's a directly personally relevant imminent, close at hand threat. With climate, it's much harder. When the roof bleached, I think it did wake some people up to the idea that, that definitely we had a global warming problem. And 
that some harm was being done that might not be reversible, but does it really move people to action? Or do they just think, oh, well, I guess I'll take a trip somewhere else? Similarly with the fires. I mean, certainly it was a wake up call at the time, but how many people just think, oh, lucky I don't live in a bushfire zone. Similarly, there's actually millions of people at risk of what's described as a biblical scale famine in Africa. How many people even know about this? So to me, the key is you've got to somehow find a way to make it about now. And the best thing I can see in terms of making it about now is actually the research about the point of no return, that the point of no return could be before we reach two degrees of warming and that that is very hard to avoid now. So actually, I think pictures like this have more impact than the figures, because pictures like this. Is the, is the one I use now in the Heading for Extinction talk, but paired with graphs and images like this, like this, like this. This is the you know hardcore science bit. So this is the Will Steffen study showing that we've destabilized the Earth system. We're heading for the edge of the waterfall, the planetary threshold, and we could tumble into hothouse Earth unless we paddle hard for the shore and restabilize the Earth. I like this because even though it's a graph, it's sort of like those pictures. And I think in the end, we've got to tell a story. Now, even the thing with tipping points is the main pain is down the track. I mean, one of the other things that I use is um, Hans Schellenhuber saying that if we reach four degrees of warming, he estimates the earth has only a capacity to support a billion people. But that's later in the century. What's the link? The link is young people, and our children, for us oldies, right? And the thing that links it is, is the issue of children. Being scared for one's children if you've already got them or having fear about even having children, the fear of what they'll experience in their lifetime. So that's describing the threat. The threat is extinction and the collapse of human civilization. The question is how to tell it as a story that people can relate to. In terms of proportionate response, this is partly, I think, what's paralysed people because we've got a whole lot of organisations talking about 100% renewables as though that's the proportionate response. But scientists know and campaigns know it's not. It's not going to fix it. It's not enough. In fact, the pessimism, I think, comes not so much from the lack of technical, technical technological solutions. But people's pessimism about fixing it comes from our politics. And I think there's people who think maybe that we could still fix it in terms of technology. What they think is that our political system is so broken that it can't be fixed. So that's where the one inspiring proportionate response comes in, which is rebellion. It's no use pretending that our political system is going to fix this without mass civil disobedience. Mass civil disobedience is not guaranteed to work, but it's the best chance we've got. So that's why I think Extinction Rebellion has a proportionate response where mostly others don't. We're rebelling to save ourselves. It's a, in a sense, a positive message. Act now. It's based on self-sacrifice because I think part of living in climate proof is you've got to show that you personally are taking it seriously. It's got fun involved too, which is good. And it's already... I think the climate emergency approach, the climate emergency messaging in general, is already making some headway. I mean, this was when we were blocking the roads in the Spring Rebellion in October. We blocked the roads in Melbourne for several days of the week. And at the end of this very negative age article, we had 84% of 135,000 people actually supporting the, project, the protests. It's not just saying that it's an emergency, but supporting our effort to do something about it. So I think that's... that's uh, very great vote of confidence in strong messaging. So yeah, Greta's an absolute master, mistress of emergency messaging. And one of the things she says, which I think is important, is it's not about hope. And it's even more powerful, I think, in a sense, hearing it from Kate Marvel as a climate scientist. And what she says is we need courage, we don't need hope. She doesn't have any hope. It's a sad thing. 
but what we need is courage, the resolve to do well without the assurance of a happy ending. When there's a fire in a building, you don't sit there and go, oh, I'm not going to try and get out because I'm not sure I can get out. When there's a war, you don't go, well, I'm not going to fight because I'm not sure if we're going to win. Courage is a different way of framing and much more effective. So what would leadership look like? Leadership in dangerous times. The important thing is to remember that we are herd animals. So when we think we're in danger, we look around to see what others are doing and we look around to see what leaders are doing. So it's no use blaming ourselves for not having got through with this message years and years ago when we started trying. We had not had the help of leaders. When Chamberlain was saying that Nazis weren't a problem, the uh, UK public were not that worried. When Winston Churchill said that they were, that the Nazis were a problem and that we had to go and fight, then that's when people were mobilised. And the thing with a war is, you, you know, it's, it's like climate in the sense that you can't see it out the window. It's not like people in Australia could look out the window and see Nazis coming. It's not like a fire coming over the hill. It's stories, it's powerful stories that bring a threat that's far away or in the future into the present. That's what moves people to action. We've got to shift the pot the Overton window, as people say. Um, we've got to shift what's viewed as possible. We already have shifted people's views. Two thirds of the Australian public now recognise that we're facing a climate emergency and will agree that we need world world scale mobilisation to address it. We're part, part way there. The trouble is most people have no idea what that actually means or looks like. So we've got to shift it. The first and obvious thing that I always say is we've got to say it's an emergency. There's no chance of getting emergency action if we're saying it and we should not be using climate change as a denier meme. It links to the climate is always changing. But the other thing that's very, very powerful is congruent emotion. Like if somebody was just about to kill a whole lot of people in the centre of Melbourne and nobody was doing anything, what would your emotion be like? It would be intense, it would be angry, it would be afraid, it would be desperate, it would be running from place to place trying to get someone to do something. And I, I think Greta is someone who does this very well. I think Roger does it very well too, which is partly why I'm really looking forward to hear what he has to say. It's not business as usual, it's an emergency. And last but not least, we know we're winning when Andrew Bolt writes a whole page on how bad Roger Hallam and Gail Bradbrook are. We don't have to worry about people coming back and attacking us and criticising us because it's just a sign we're winning. They're entering our frame. Is it an emergency? Are we facing extinction instead of us doing the usual thing of entering their frame? Is it real? Is it happening? Yes, no. So if you're getting the urge to join the rebellion and you haven't already, don't hesitate. So um, just before I hand over to, to you, Roger, just a couple of quick comments I was thinking about while Jane was, um, Jane was talking. First of all, let's be really clear that there is a reason that the movement shies away from the difficult messages. And uh, I would go back, as I said in the opening, historically, there's always been pressure on for a moderate message. No, don't, be, don't, don't scare everyone. Don't be full of fear. Give people hope. Now, I've thought a lot of, about that issue. Why, why is that such a strong idea in the movement and in the debate on these sort of issues? And I think there's a couple of points to make there. First of all, it's very uncomfortable. Um, Margaret Klein Solomon's written about this, that the truth is uncomfortable. It's not nice to go up, you know, to a dinner party and have a conversation about the collapse of civilization. It's not what we do to kind of engage people in a, in a, in a fun conversation. So it's awkward. It's uncomfortable, it's difficult. It's unpleasant, and the truth often is. And so naturally, we shy away from the difficult messages. We shy away from those difficult conversations. It doesn't mean you need to make every conversation you have about the in, impending doom of civilization, because your friends you know, may not want to spend much time with you if you do. But when you do have the conversation, it's very important to be clear, because it is uncomfortable, and you have to get to the stage of discomfort to get to the point of engagement. The second question is, where does the pushback come on, you know, on this issue? Where does the pushback come against fear? It normally comes from people who don't want to act, right? So the reason they say, well, we shouldn't be too fearful, we shouldn't be too extreme, you're a climate extremist, you're a, you're a doom and gloomer, right, is because the people who are saying that argument very often 
are those who don't wish to see action on the climate emergency. Um, and, you know, because this doesn't apply, as Jane just very clearly articulated, this is not applied anywhere else. You don't have a bushfire emergency and go, look, if you wouldn't mind, it's actually a nice day for a drive. So why don't you please leave your home and go somewhere else? It'll be a nice day for a drive. No, you say you're all going to fucking die if you don't move, right? So you, you, you get a very intense message. And that, of course, is because the science and the evidence is very clear that fear does work as long as there is, you know, appropriate response to take uh, when you understand the fear. So this anti-fear thing doesn't come from any logic. It doesn't come from any argument that's based in reality or applied anywhere else, right? In the rest of our society, when we need to engage people in action and there is a fearful, scary threat, a bushfire, a war, a drunk driving, you know, incident, etc., then fear is used. And so I think it's very important to recognise that the evidence is overwhelming that it works and there are reasons that we don't do it and those reasons don't stand up to a great deal of analysis, I don't think, in terms of logic behind them. So uh, with that comment, let me hand over to Roger, an um, old friend of mine. Uh, since Extinction Rebellion started, I've been a huge fan of XR and the work they've done. I think it's but, but, you know, arguably one of the most, if not the most important thing that's happened, I think, in the climate movement um, globally in the last decade. Uh, Roger is one of the co-founders um, as an organic farmer, um, as well as being a co-founder of XR. I spent a long time studying the evidence behind mass civil disobedience. Um, what does work and what doesn't work and what can we learn from history about the tactics that work, not just about how to engage people, but what is the critical mass that you need to get to um, to get that kind of response. Um, he's recently the author of a book, Common Sense of the 21st Century, Only Nonviolent Rebellion Can Stop Climate Breakdown and Social Collapse. I'll throw in a sort of empirical reality, as it were, which is Extinction Rebellion sort of started off with 14 people in a cafe with what 200 quid in the bank 18 months ago and um, within 18 months became the number one influencer in the world on the climate issue stroke catastrophe um, so that's interesting <laughs> how did that happen an interesting empirical sort of um, uh, issue so um, basically I'm a consider myself a ruthless empiricist. In other words, I observe what's happening and then work from that. I don't start with theory or prejudice, or at least I try not to. So uh, I'm a award-winning sort of researcher at King's College, if you want me to sound impressive. Uh, I'm also an organic farmer, uh, which isn't so impressive. <laughs> anyway, so let's uh, start. So I'm going to be a little bit philosophical because I think the roots of how fucked we are basically go back to deep ideas about how humans work and how society works and what the meaning of life is and all this sort of stuff. It always sounds a little bit abstract, but in times of crisis, people start to integrate their fundamental belief systems. And we're obviously we're in a time of crisis at the moment. So I'm going to make three propositions to you on why the global sort of bureaucratic NGO uh, scientific sort of class is like empirically fucked in terms of how it understands the world. So first of all, there's the, the, uh, the idea that you can separate action from non-action. So you notice like this is session is about messaging. It's not messaging and action because um, all this stuff comes from the enlightenment, by the way, it's all these like, you know, guys in 18th century France sort of hypothesizing in their salons and they came up with the bright idea you can separate action from speech. Well, you arguably can't. Um, so in other words, like action, action is a message and message is an action in actuality. So that's the first sort of like crap idea we've got. The second crap idea we've got is that, act, uh, that you can separate information from emotion that there's emotion, that's like what, what you know, people that are a bit on, 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 on uh, uh, that need to be looked down upon, <laughs> they do emotion, proper sensible people do information, and information is the name of the game, people change through information, total bollocks, <laughs> but there we go. Um, uh, the third idea is repression is better than the truth. 
So, you know, this is a traditional Western bourgeois idea. Don't upset people at the dinner table and what have you. Don't tell people the truth. It's far better to play safe, be pleasant and, uh, and don't tell the truth. In other words, it's better to lie and you'll get what you want through lying. And uh, that's primarily, I guess, what the default position is of the people that run the world, including the global sort of profession, middle, professional middle classes. Okay, so why is this rubbish? Um, basically because people in the NGO class and the globalized professional middle class only really look at one literature, which is the reductive enlightenment, sort of scientific reductive information bias literature. They don't actually read any other literatures. So there's a big crisis in academia at the moment because the last 30, 40 years of empirical research has fundamentally and catastrophically undermined the Enlightenment bias. Uh, and I, I'll sort of, there's, there's subsections of this, but the, you might summarize it in what's called the emotional turn. So the emotional turn basically says emotions run the show. So in social movement theory, you've got like books on Larry Kramer and ACT UP where the empirical evidence today is as soon as he got on the streets and said, you're going to fucking die if you don't get out and disturb things, then that's when things changed. In other words, social scientists have discovered it's not structural determinism, it's not information, it's emotion that drives social movements and political success. Or you can look at neuroscience where they've discovered that without emotions you can't make rational decisions. Or you can look at behavioural economics and show that people are atomised decision makers that make rational decisions. They're basically emotional subjects, you know, subject to hurting mechanisms and what have you. So, like, the, so there's a big sort of like turmoil going on as people try to repress all this empirical information. So the second thing is like the postmodernist turn. The postmodernist turn is basically saying there isn't objectivity. You know, there's lots of problems with this point of view. But you read a bit of Foucault. I don't think many scientists read Foucault. Well, basically, what Foucault would say is, as soon as the scientist or an NGO person gets up on television, within about five seconds, you're fucked because the whole essence of your communication is, I'm in charge. You're stupid. You don't need to listen to me and variations on the theme. In other words, the very act of your construction is an act of dominance and an act of alienation. And this is one of the reasons, of course, why you know millions of people right, vote for right-wing populists and what have you, because like left-wing rationalists don't understand the very basics of their domination. So you know that's a little bit of an extreme position, but it's interesting literature you might want to delve into. The third thing, which is is traditional Roman Republican uh, rhetoric, right? Rhetoric got pushed out of universities about 50 years ago because of the Enlightenment hegemony or whatever you want to call it. You know, we don't want rhetoric because rhetoric basically means like, you know, dealing with emotions, dealing with tricks, dealing with lying and all the rest of that. But uh, the, the ex ex expelling of rhetoric from the public sphere by the left-wing sort of, um, you know, rationalist sort of domination of the public space has meant that it's just opened up the potential for right-wing populists to do it. And what Jane's really doing is not really saying anything unusual, like any Roman senator would perfectly understand what she's saying, because that what you know the ancient art of rhetoric is all about using emotion and manipulation uh, and of course like the you know the um, the biggest sort of bl black spot of the scientific community is they don't think they're dealing with in, in manipulation but what Foucault would say and any Roman senator would say is everything's manipulation right when you get up and speak you are there's no objective way of speaking so, you know, there's pros and cons to all this sort of thing. But, you know, the point is, is to sort of shake things up a little bit. All right, so why is this sort of got, why is, why is the climate change movement being cut so catastrophically ineffectual for 30 years? While, you know, slightly controversially, I will say, because of extreme social inequality. So over the last 30 years, working class culture, working class people have been systematically excluded from the public sphere. And working class people and working class culture 
is primarily an emotional culture which she deals with you know prose and emotion and you know you know saying words like fuckery and things like that which as you know it might worry aware if you say that in the public sphere then you get into a lot of trouble so um that's the, the the main scenario so i'm going to give you sort of it's a combination of you know uh enlightenment you know enlightenment total empirical bollocks and the domination of the middle class and then the exclusion of the working class and nowhere is that more extreme than in the ngo sector and in the art sector and in the creative sectors as i'm sure you might be aware if you look at the stats okay so well i'll give you a classic example which is very funny i think which is like i went and with eight students into king's colleges you know a nice uh nice gothic hall and and threw paint around and caused seven thousand pounds worth of damage and the uh the vice principal came down to the uh to the situation with about five minutes and he came up to me and he said roger roger he said this is shutting down the conversation this is shutting down the conversation and i said to him this is the first conversation i've had with you right so you can see the juxtaposition here between the complete empirical nonsense of supposedly one of the most intelligent person people in britain and the reality which has been trying to get a conversation with this guy for about four months he's not going to give a fuck because we haven't done anything the only time the only way to communicate with the ruling class is to disrupt them then they talk to you and then you get a result right whether you think that's good or bad you can't agree, you can't disagree with the empirics and of course then i went on hunger strike and of course then the middle class ngo sector completely stood on me because they don't want people going on hunger strike because it's going to be upsetting right so no one's going to do that when i went to see the chief executive greenpeace what he said was yeah 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 we know how hunger strikes work but we're not going to do it it's far too scary systematic structural attempt by the global the global professionals class to stop what is necessary from happening and if you read martin luther king's uh, letter from a birmingham jail he says the same thing the biggest enemy here are liberals <laughs> not the opposition and you know harsh harsh words but you know there we go that was before martin luther king was sanitized by the global middle class <laughs> no, he was actually a tricky guy so if you want to see what this looked like look at the first four minutes of in love and anger by larry kramer when he talks in a universe uh, a hospital uh hospital uh, uh panel right he gets up and gives a speech so it's called in love and anger you can see it on, on on uh um on youtube it only takes four minutes of your time and you, what you see there is a case study in how political change happens so i'll finish there great thanks roger listen just a, a quick question and then happy to take um questions in the chat from other people and i'll pass them on or we can unmute if we have time to do that as well but roger that's great and obviously very strong in terms of the evidence space and the logic of why this approach works You've done an enormous amount of media yeah. interviews in the last uh, last year or so, um, and some of those have been very controversial, um, and they certainly had a big impact. Tell us a bit about how you apply that thinking that you've just outlined uh, to a journalist who has no background in the issue. Not about the why we should use fear, but how do you actually describe the climate emergency in a way which gets their attention, applying the sort of principles that you're talking about? Well, the first thing to say is in terms of in terms of responding to the emergency and being effective, like 95% of your efforts should be on transgressive action and 5% of your effort on talking to journalists. OK, mm -hmm. so that's principle number one, right? You know, action creates mobilization and uh, what have you is actions that count. But in so much as I spend 5% of my time talking to journalists and I do about two or three interviews a week, like what 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 i what i uh moved towards i suppose I two general principles which is not to answer any of the questions because all the questions basically push you into push you into sort of that, that sort of middle class salon sort of way of talking about things and secondly in so much as 
you know, I've got the emotional strength is to be emotional to the journalist, which obviously will get you into a lot of trouble. But, um, you know, it's probably the two principles. I think the first principle is starting to happen. I've tried to get Extinction Rebellion never to answer any questions from journalists, and it's starting to get from, get with the programme. In terms of being emotional, I don't think that will happen unless there's a working class movement. I think m m middle class movements are structurally incapable of being emotional in the public sphere. I mean, I've watched like, you know, whatever, 2,000 science, pro science um, presentations, right? I haven't seen a scientist break down in tears once. I mean, if, if, if you want to change society, you've got to get women over 50 into the public sphere, you know, who've got kids and grandchildren. They know how to emote because they emote all the time because life is hard, you know. Um, so, you know, th th this isn't going to be sorted through design. It's going to be sorted through structural disruption in the climate change movement. And I'm not saying that because I'm trying to be unpleasant. Again, I'm just a ruthless empiricist. Uh, and that's starting, starting to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you look at historical movements, um, historical movements always start with, you know, middle class intellectuals and then they get terribly upset when, when you know, it becomes a mass movement because it gets a little bit rough and ready. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what's happening at the moment, which is why a lot of people don't like me. <laughs> that's right. Thank you. Um, Jane, you've, you've mentioned this issue as well, how to communicate in the media and to a broad public in your, your comments. Do you want to add anything to that? Well, I want to just emphasise one thing that Roger said there, and that is that if you're not taking action, you're not even going to be in the media, so you don't have to worry about it. I mean, all the years we honed that climate emergency message, but we never did anything dramatic, and so no one ever really <laughs> came to talk to us about it. But the other thing is, once you do get there, like the thing that works, I think, is that same emotional message. So yeah, there was an interview. I was doing with Neil Mitchell, so he's a local shock jock. And he was giving me a terribly hard time, like terribly, horribly hard time, just trying to trap me and trick me. And, and the thing I said to him halfway through is I said, look, Neil, I'm doing this for, for your children too, if you've got any, I didn't know. And he went, oh, Jane, that's a bit personal. <laughs> but at the end, when the microphone was off, he said, oh, actually, my daughter agrees with you. And I said, well, look, Neil, you've got to come across the other side like you did on fracking, because even though he's right wing, he was actually anti-fracking. And, and he really looked a bit, oh, I told him about Sheldon Hoover too, that only had been in Survive at four degrees, which he obviously he didn't know who Sheldon Hoover was. It was probably a bit technical. But, but yeah, the kids thing, it's actually is amazingly effective. Yeah, and I think, Roger, your point about that, um, you know, if you get a scientist, I think, Jane, you mentioned it too, if you get a scientist outside the formal conversation, they're deeply emotional, very direct and very engaged. As soon as you put them into the formal structures, they become very modest and moderate and careful in what they're saying. Um, and and you know, likewise, I think it is that you know, people are emotional about the issue. It's a natural state, of course, to be quite emotional about the potential end of civilization, right? But then it all gets modified very carefully in the public discourse um, as a result. So I think in that sense, it's just being natural and, 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 and acknowledging, you know, Roger, you've done a lot of this, you know, being prepared to be attacked, you know, being creating the confrontation, you know, Martin Luther King, everyone's hero now, you know, was a deeply, deeply unpopular person for most Americans at that time, right? There are many examples where enormous anger and fear is directed towards the person who raises these, these issues. And that again puts us back in our box being very careful. Oh, we don't want to upset people, I don't want to be attacked. In actual fact, being attacked is often the best result you can ask for um, because, it, because it means people have engaged on that emotional level and they're being fearful. Therefore, I think it's a very important idea. Yeah, I mean, there's two, you know, there's two, let me get, you know, being a, try, I'm trying to pretend to try and be a social scientist. So, like, here's two data points, right? 1961, I think it was, like, Martin Luther King was the most unpopular man in America, right? 1968 he was the same what happened like the reason he was saying to 1968 is because is because he was the most unpopular man in america right in 1961 you see what i mean uh, or or you know or here's a quote from larry you know larry uh, kramer is we didn't give a flying foot what people thought of us and that was our strength right so this it, 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 it's an inverted logic you see yeah. you, you see what i mean 
And if, if you want a case study in how to of effective communication, then watch uh, Russell Brand on, on Newsnight, right? One of the most famous interviews in the modern, you know, era. Like 10 million people watched it on 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 uh, on YouTube. Why did they watch it? Because it was completely nothing about changing the world, even though it was all about changing the world. The reason was is it, it didn't just get a little bit personal. We know what Russell Brand does. You know, he's a classic Roman senator. He just like talks about sex, and he talk. You know, and the most hilarious thing uh, he did is reached out and touched the knee of the interviewer. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone around the country was in hysterics, right? Because no one actually does that, right? Mm. No one actually touches anyone, for God's sake, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, um, in in order in in other, in other words, like uh, I don't think many people watch climate deniers, but you know, I watch quite a lot of climate deniers. What you watch, what you'll notice is when a climate denier does a presentation for the first ten minutes, they don't talk about anything to do with the climate. Basically, what they do is ingratiate themselves with the audience, right? They'll talk about their son, their daughter. They'll talk about some adventure they had in the Himalayas. You know, you just don't know what they're talking about. You're just lost. But within 10 minutes, basically, that person's captured the audience. So it doesn't matter what they say after that. The audience is going to agree with them because they've obviously, you know, decided the guy's a nice guy. And I'm taking it in. You know, everyone's taking it in. I think, well, this guy's pretty nice. And then it takes about a quarter of an hour to work out the guy saying that the climate emergency doesn't exist. You see what I mean? And, you know, the, the literature, you know, social psychology literature is full of this, right? There's a book called Psychology of Persuasion, is that what it's called, Jane? You know, it's probably the classic in the literature. It's all about, you know, sales techniques and all the rest of it and how people convince each other to do things. And the last thing is about presenting them with facts. So, you know, so, tricky. Roger, we, we, Roger and I did an um, XRTV thing recently and we talked a bit about the, the level of the issue of sacrifice, which is a few questions here on. And I've been concrete about the fact that yes, you are going to miss out. You are going to, to fix climate change, we're going to sacrifice. We're going to ration the availability of transport, ration the availability of food, ration meat and so on. There's also a question here about being concrete. In your book, you know, there's a whole bunch of information here on what does this look like in a practical way. How important do you think that whole issue of being concrete in terms of the, the climate emergency is? You know, I wrote a paper on this 10 years ago the one degree war plan, which laid out the, the sort of technocratic view of how you would cut emissions by 50% in five years. Do you think that that concreteness is important in terms of the actions that are being taken? Or is it really, is that sort of goes, that, that's alongside the emotion, isn't it? You have to say the emotional fear, the need to act. And Jane talked about the fact that we also need to say, yes, but there's action we can take. So you have been quite strong on that, Roger, and Jane, you have as well in terms of saying, look, you know, we need to actually think about the sacrifices we need to make as a society to achieve this. And the NGO community, by and large, runs a mile from that idea and that sort of delusion that we can have it all. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what we need to understand, I think, is that when a, when a system comes under pressure, it bifurcates. Right? This is central to complexity theory. What, what, what I mean by that is, is there's a whole logic, there's a whole existential logic of the NGO sector, right, which actually works, but, there's, but it only works in a, in, a, in a social structure that disappeared in 1995 or year 2000, right? So it's not like the logic is incorrect, it's just like functionally useless in the present structure. And what happens, what people find difficult to understand is that a, new, a completely new logic emerges. So it's a bit like, it, it, you know, it's a bit like you tell your teenage, you know, son to do washing up, right? You know, maybe 90% of the time it, it, it works by giving that, your son information. But there's a certain point at which you just have to shout at them, right? Mm -hmm. And then that works. <laughs> you see what I mean? It's like there's a fate, there's a transition. So... You know, you know, for, you know, bourgeois repression works and that's why it's very popular, right? But there's a certain point at which you have to have working class emotion and that works as well. So, so what, what the NGOs try to do is not to give people the truth. For instance, like the sort of middle class left space, it talks about the, uh, you know, the Clio, what's it called, the 
the Green New Deal, right? The Green De New Deal, as everyone knows, is bullshit, right? You know, people know it's bullshit because they intuitively know they've been bullshitted to for 30 years by the conventional left. And that's why no one really takes it in. It'd be far more effective to go to the Western working class and say, you know, no, you're not going to have great green jobs. What's going to happen is you're going to get loads poorer. It's going to be really shit. And we're going back to the 1940s at a minimum and specifically lay out why that's the case. And then people will start listening to you because they know you're not bullshitting, you see what I mean? But, that, yeah. you know, no one's going to do that in the left space because mm -hmm. everyone's still pretending you can lie to people and it will work. And the thing about lying to people is it does work, right? Everyone lies because it works. But also everyone knows there's a point at which if you lie too much, you basically no one believes you anymore. And the reason why the NGO sector and the traditional left have no like leverage and they keep losing elections is because they've been lying to people for too long. You see what I mean? So it's far better to just say, uh, actually, it's all fucked and everyone's going to get a lot poorer. And like you were saying, Paul, on our interview, you know, start laying out exactly what's going to happen. Probably going to have £100 a week. You're not going to be flying to Spain anymore. Um, you're probably going to have to work 60, 70 hours a week. Your life expectancy is probably going to be about 40 to 50, if you're lucky. Um, there's going to be no educational opportunities and you're probably going to have a fairly awful Italian government telling you what to do. All right. <laughs> and that's it. Right. That's what's coming down the road. That's basically what Paul's been saying to the world, you know, for the last 20 years, that sort of thing. And what my prediction is, people will go, OK. So that's better than extinction. Let's go for that. In the mm. same way as Churchill said in 1940, blood, sweat and tears. I have nothing to offer you apart from that. And they knew he was speaking. He wasn't bullshitting, right? He wasn't doing appeasement. He was just saying, OK, we're in this. It's going to be really hard. Loads of you are going to die, but it's the right thing to do. And we may win, but we don't know who will. Yeah. Right? That's right, what Churchill you. said to the nation in, in 1940. Yeah, no, a, lot, a lot of evidence on that. Jane, can I go back to you um, also on the same issue um, of, of communicating about what it means in a practical sense? Roger's put it pretty directly there. Um, but also, if we can, as we're heading towards the end time, um, not just of society, but of this video call as well, um, if you could make some final, just some final comments as well as commenting on that issue of practicalities, then Roger, I'll come back to you for a final word of wisdom, all three. Jane. The good news and the bad news about this fight we're in is that we're up against a relatively small number of unbelievably powerful people who, you know, and I've tried to understand their psychology, I can't really, but I think it must be like some sort of addiction where they can only see the money and they can only see, you know, power and success. And even though in the back of their minds, they must know that they're destroying everything. But, you know, in the same way as, you know, a heroin addict can only see the next hit, that's the only way I can explain it. So we've got, you know, a small number of crazy people but with absolutely unprecedented and mammoth power. And so the importance to me in a sense of messaging, but it's basically of movement building, is that we finally have something which threatens all of us, even those crazy people. Um, so we have an issue that potentially if we can explain it and, and mobilise in the right way, unites everyone, like a, unites the 99.9% .9 against the crazy people. So I think that... You know, it's a David and Goliath struggle, but I do think we've got the numbers, if not the, you know, the, some of the levers of power. So people are asking about the Citizens' Assembly. Like, to me, when you go and do the talk and you go and talk to people, people don't ask about, well, how are you going to, you know, govern after you win the re rebellion? Um, it's an anxiety sort of inside the movement, I think, more than outside. But outside what people do say is that, you know, our system is broken. Like you can get 70, 80% of people agree that our system is broken. You can get 90% saying they want an anti-corruption commission. Um, I think people are very clear on what's not working. And I think part of the genius of Roger really in his messaging is actually focus on the fact that things are so bad and gonna get so much worse that basically rebelling and winning and allowing ordinary common sense of ordinary people to have any kind of influence on the outcome. It's going to be so much better than completely destroying everything. Like you're starting from such a low baseline that if you can rebel and do anything that's not complete destruction, 
you're ahead. So I think that's, you know, it's a, sort of a negative message and sort of a positive message. Um, I find it very hard to explain the citizens' assemblies. I, I, I've become enthusiastic about them, but it was, you know, it was a process. Um, but I think the way to explain it is just to say that we want people power, that ordinary people can do better than politicians. You'll get, again, 90% of people will agree with that. Um, the exact mechanism by which ordinary people should have their say, I don't think we have to explain that in the first instance. Um, but look, I think, yeah, going back to the pandemic, the pandemic is an example of how clear messaging that scares the living daylights out of people can get them to act. Mm, great, thanks, Jane. Um, Roger, last, uh, last comment, and then I'll make a few wrapping up comments. Yeah, well, it's a bit early in the morning in the UK, so I'm not feeling enormously courageous, but <laughs> I'll just about get myself into some action to say what I'm going to say, which is like, you know, I, I, you know, I'm fundamentally question. I'm fundamentally questioning the frame of this session, right? If you haven't noticed, which is it's about messaging. Messaging is like five percent of the shaboodle, right? Ninety percent, five percent of the shaboodle is action, so, and you know action transgressive action is ten thousand times more powerful than conventional action or something in the ballpark of that so you know if you're sitting here thinking oh you know i'm going to have a chat to other people in my ngo um you know the fact of the matter is that's probably worse than useless because it's not going to work um what's going to work is transgressive action within the ngo sector and i i always say this and you know, I don't think many people do it. I said it to a bunch of God, guarded uh, journalists. But, you know, what, what, what will change the NGO sector is when some people in the NGO sector go to the chief executive and say, the whole structural approach is wrong and we need a transformation. And that transformation is to say that everyone is, has to basically go to the streets in the next six months and close down the government. That's it. That's all there is to do because that's all there is in, you know, in an emergency, that's all you can do. And the only way you're going to convince people to do that is to take some super glue into the chief executive's office. And when he says that's a really interesting idea, you know, you say it's not an interesting idea. It's about the survival of my children. And then you super glue yourself to his desk. And then there's a 50 50 chance you get sacked or the 50 50 chance you transform the organization. Right. You know, that's, that's how you're going to train, change the NGO sector. And if you don't do that, you're not going to change it, right? It's structurally fucked. And I'm just saying that as an empirical scientist, right? You know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you dispute what I say, but I'm pretty clear about it at this stage of the game. So, you know, if you not, don't want to do that, like, you know, pretty historically irrelevant at this stage in history, uh, as I see it. And I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that we can try to be unpleasant. You know, I'm a nice guy. My mum was a Methodist minister. You know, I was brought up to be polite and middle class and all that stuff. But like, um, but that's the that's where we're at at the moment. And if 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 the middle class movements don't get their shit together, then we'll have fascism, or we'll have, you know, we'll, or or you there'll be some working class left wing populist movement. But either way, like it's on the way out. You know, the whole neoliberal construction of, uh, of society is on the way out. And, um, you know, interesting times, as the Chinese say. <laughs> so, there, there we go. Thank that's you, Roger. No, that's that's actually it. a good, a good uh, entry into my, um, my closing comments. First of all, Jane and Roger, thank you very much for your input um, and your commentary, not just now, but over the years. It's been a breath of fresh air in a otherwise state and incredibly ineffective um, climate movement more broadly, which I think we have to face up to the reality of, not that, we, not that they're bad people, but the, the bottom line is the movement has failed in its task. Um, and when you keep on failing, you have to ask why. And that's what you two have been doing for a long time, is to ask why, and is there a different approach? Um, the final comment really, building on your point, Roger, is that you know, messaging is irrelevant unless someone's listening, which, uh, which Jane, you said. Unless someone's listening, it, it, there was no point having the right message. And I can tell you, as someone who's been arguing this um, climate emergency mobilisation for a decade, having the right message, my message hasn't changed for a decade. It hasn't had any impact um, of any consequence because you haven't had the civil disobedience. Right? And there is no, I don't think, any example in history where you get really radical disruptive change 
against the resistance of the status quo without mass, very direct, very confrontational civil disobedience. That's what Roger's work all talks about and it's what the history of many, many social movements um, shows us, is that you have to get in the face of the system. And, it, and, and you can either get in the face of the system by an economic shock and collapse, which will get their attention, but then we're in, you know, we're going there anyway, but how far we go there is an issue. But when we're acting as we are now before the crisis truly hits, not ecologically, but, but socially, um, you have to face up to the fact that only civil disobedience at mass scale in a very, very challenging way, blockading streets, shutting down bridges, closing down roads, closing down cities. Nothing short of that, I don't think, is any evidence um, of having worked historically in driving massive social change. And Roger obviously wants to say something else, so over to you. <laughs> Breaking the rules again. Uh, yes, so just as a little sort of end, end uh, story on this is as as I've told you, like I caused seven thousand pounds of criminal inverted commas damage at King's College and got suspended and blah blah blah. And then a year a year and a half later, like I was looking Crown Court for criminal damage with my co uh, defendant. So we talked to like a whole bunch of you know expert lawyers in inverted commas who said there wasn't a chance in hell of us being found not guilty and that we should do a plea bargain and you know blah 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 including like two like top judges and then they really criticized us because we didn't do any preparation i basically did half an hour of preparation before we went into court uh, me and the other guy we just sat there in the you know working out what we were going to say about 10 minutes before we spoke it was a free day trial we spoke to the jury the jury went out for the minimum amount of time uh, they came back, unanimous verdict, not guilty, right? It's a case study in emotion over rationality. Mm. I rest my case, yeah. gentlemen. Good. <laughs> Excellent. On that note, um, thank you very much for everyone who's participated in your questions and your commentary. Jane, thanks for uh, organising. Roger, thanks for getting up an hour earlier than you needed to. But nevertheless, you were still awake when we arrived, so much appreciated mm -hmm. and thank you. Thank you both for all of your work over many, many years. Thank you. And same thing. Thanks, Paul. Thank you so much for uh, hosting. And yeah, thank you for being here, all three of you as well. Really, really informative. Great. Thank you.